All right. The Visiting Artist Program funded by PAPA's Graduate Program brings an outstanding roster of local, national, and international artists to PAPA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. The program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion about contemporary art and ideas. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Rose Nestler joining us. Rose Nestler lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. She holds an MFA from Brooklyn College, Nestler has exhibited in the United States and internationally, including ex exhibitions at Project Panjay, I'm going to butch all these names, by the way, Public Gallery, Fisher Parish, Hesse, Hesse Flateau, Theory, Goldberg, and Brick. Her work was curated in a two-person show at Spring Break in 2019, and she was a Lighthouse Works Fellow in 2018. She will be an artist in residence at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans in 2022. Upcoming exhibitions include solo shows at Public Gallery in London in 2021 and at Miss Gallery in New York in 2022. Her work has been featured and reviewed in Juxtapose, Vulture, Make, and Metal Magazine. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rose. You may now begin sharing your screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. How is my volume level? You're good. good. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm going to get started. Sharing my screen. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll go between here and um, uh, some Vimeo video clips as well. Um, and I'm going to do kind of a combination of um, just talking off the cuff um, along with um, reading some things that I've written about specific pieces um, and about my work. Um, I find that I'm usually able to write about works much better than speak about them. Um, so I'm gonna, that's why I'm including some writing as well. Um, but I also think that it's really valuable to hear artists talk about their work, you kind of hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, so thank you all for being here and for giving me um, your time and energy and ears and eyes for this afternoon. Um, okay. So um, just, I'm gonna read just a few things that I put down about um, kind of where I'm coming from, um, how I grew up, and then just like a little brief statement about generally what my work is about, um, though it's constantly changing. So a little bit about me. Um, I was born in the early eighties um, and I was born in Washington state, um, but I grew up in Seattle. My parents met and married um, actually on a spiritual commune in Tennessee called The Farm. My mom uh, was coming from a white Protestant upper middle class upbringing in New Jersey. And my dad was coming from a poor white working class in and out of orphanages, dropped out of high school in eighth grade or dropped out of school in eighth grade, Catholic upbringing, um, growing up in Nashville. And they met in Tennessee. Um, and somehow vegan farming, psychedelics, and um, love brought them together uh, in the early 70s. So um, kind of going back to that, that uh, their meeting on this, that spiritual commune. Um, so it's interesting because um, I, I am a spiritual person, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily religious, but I did grow up going to church. Um, it was interesting that my, parent, my parents started with this hippy-dippy spirituality um, and then felt at some point that it would be good um, to join <laughs> a church and have me have some normal normalcy in my life, um, being that they both came from Catholic and Protestant upbringings. So I did grow up going to church um, and it has been in strange ways an influence on my work. Um, at, I was really into it, um, but for me, it was like a material study. Um, so as a kid and a teenager, that's essentially why I kept going, I think, because I, I was obsessed with the velvet and the chalice, the pomp and the ceremony and the singing. 
um, basically because I'm a theater person at my deepest core. <laughs> and that's where I became before I, uh, that's where I started before visual arts. Um, and I wanted all that stuff, the music, the materials and the objects, um, the ceremony, everything, all of that was really exciting to me. Um, so my fabric sculptures often take the form of oversized anthropomorphized clothing, access accessories, artifacts, and tools. Through reinterpreting the range of objects that I recreate, I employ forms and materials that serve to highlight and simultaneously subvert the ways that gendered and trite stereotypes play out on or impact the experience of their wearers uh, or users. I reimagine objects that offer moments of self-preservation and humor amidst a sea of shame and sadness brought on by a capitalist-driven patriarchy. I'm most engaged with the tension between my own rejection of and concurrent attraction to the materiality and formal qualities that these gendered garments and tools have assumed throughout history. So I'm going to begin, um, I'm gonna start from the beginning, um, well, start from 2017 and, and kind of take you up to where I am currently. Um, so the only thing that I'll share from my MFA is this piece here. Um, it's called Stone Age Toolkit. And um, it's sort of the reason why I share it is because I still feel very um, connected to the content um, and kind of um, drive to make this, this work in 2017 for my thesis. Um, and I'm still very proud of the work. Um, so I think I, um, for this piece, I carved a 24 piece set um, paleolithic stone toolkit. So I, you know, went to the library school and I meticulously copied um, paleolithic tools. Um, and they're all carved out of soapstone and alabaster. Um, and, you know, I was interested in the legacy of gender roles um, in prehistory and so interested in those gender roles and power before our ancestors essentially settled down into um, kind of the home space as we know it today, um, when they were still nomadic and kind of what those gender roles and kind of distribution of power um, in a family unit, what, what did it look like? Um, and kind of connecting that research to the gendered consumerism of a uh, home shopping network today. So I'm gonna just take us out of um, the PowerPoint for a moment and we're gonna watch a little clip of this video and hopefully Zoom uh, does okay. Hello and welcome back. I could not be more excited. We have an amazing new product today to show everyone. It is the Finrock Stone Age Toolkit. Just look at that beauty. I know. So I will be here. Okay, so this is the, the Stone Age Toolkit marketed for the modern human. This toolkit has everything you could possibly want. These tools are handcrafted by artisans in Italy, Northern Italy. The rocks are sourced from there and look at what these tools can do. Oh my goodness, they seem so versatile. So versatile. So is this meant to replace those dull everyday kind of tools that we have yeah. around the house. And don't you think those are boring? Oh, they are. Yeah, so I, boring. They're archaic at this point, aren't they? Yeah, so we actually need to go all the way back. Yes, because what else is there? What until else is there? To go back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah go back to the beginning. Um, you know, use one of these points, one of these arrowheads. Use that you're going to be really effective at getting things done. Oh, yeah. it seems like Yeah, it. I mean, I, I, it seems that no matter what it is that I need to do, I can do, do it. It's just kiss. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Use one of these chisels, same way you use a modern day chisel, but look how much more beautiful that much is. Much more beautiful. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get out of here. Okay. So um, we'll pick back up here. Um, so a little clip of Stone Age Toolkit moving on. So um, after I got it, well, while I was in grad school, I made um, this sculpture right here that my mouse is over. Um, and then it kind of uh, spawned this whole new body of work that happened um, right out of grad school and ended up in my um, first 
solo show in Brooklyn, which was at um, an artist run space uh, called Ortega y Gasset Projects. They're a wonderful space. If you don't um, know about them, look them up. Um, so the form for this sculpture that I had made that then kind of created all these other works um, was based on a scaled up uh, version of a pair of pantyhose, like the, the control top, the top of a pair of pantyhose. Um, and I, um, you know, I think in grad school, I had studied so many artists who came before me who used the pantyhose. Um, and, you know, I had had professors tell me that, you know, it was overdone. Don't even use the pantyhose. We don't even want to see it. Um, so it was interesting to me because I, there was still uh, something that, that intrigued me about just like that form of a control top um, and what needed to be contained, what needed to be smoothed out, um, you know, and, and where, where were the moments when, um, when women were like supposed to wear controlled tops, you know? Um, and that really got me thinking about um, like corporate culture and corporate costume or corporate fashion. Um, and I created this body of work called Strange Business. Um, and a lot of times in, a, in like my ideal scenario for showing my work, especially in a solo show is um, showing a combination, a combination of video and sculptural work. Um, and for this, the video was a two channel video where the, and I will show you a clip of that in a moment, where the, the um, performers costumes um, actually mirrored the, the sculptures. So they're made out of the same fabric um, as these sculptures are made out of. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Um, so there's the the first three, um, and they were named after the three graces: beauty, mirth, and elegance. Um, and the here's a little still from the video, um, and I'll show you a clip of that in a moment. But essentially, a strange business introduces three characters um, moving throughout a corporate office space. The characters' costumes are inspired by my sculptures. The form of the sculptures um, are taken from a scaled up version of the control top. Um, the pair of pantyhose uh, intended to conceal, contain, and smooth a woman's pelvic area. So scaling up allowed me to contrast the purpose of the control top. These characters are literally out of control and take up space. They're awkwardly and unabashedly powerful. The fabric that the costumes are made of is of importance to me. It speaks to women's wear, power suits, and lingerie. Each control top has a leather crotch, added, adding kind of an erotic or kinky appeal. So using this form to dictate the shape of these uncanny characters and strange business helps me to illuminate the ways in which items of clothing denote power, um, gender, and profession. So Although these characters are lustrous, colorful, and animated, um, they reject um, the male gaze completely. So in an iconic corporate setting, the three characters of Strange Business embody coworkers in a surreal and satirical way, moving through um, monotonous tasks um, synonymous with office work. The video charts, charts feminine power and camaraderie in the workplace. Um, so. I'm actually, this video is 19 minutes long, so I'm not going to um, oops, play a whole, I have a little selection for all of you. Need a giant life, begin with giant thoughts. Believe you can, and you're halfway there. Hey, 
Greatness, greatness began to be on your comfort zone. zone. The marketplace. Always rewards. Mastery. Your life reflects what you settled for. Be a champion versus the cynic, encourager versus the critic. Use the honking outside. <laughs> Seems to be a traffic jam, of course, right now. Um, okay, so um, the 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 sound um, that you just heard from Strange Business um, is actually taken from motivational quotes that were on the wall, printed on the wall of the office building that I rented to shoot the video. Um, so I got really lucky. Um, and I was kind of inspired by that found text. Um, and that ended up being a key component to a lot of my future video works. Um, I would use found text. Um, and a lot of it was coming from motivational texts that were aimed at uh, kind of corporate America uh, production, like a, you know, a production optimized um, life balance way. Um, and just how slippery that language gets um, is something that I'm continuously interested in. Um, so with this work, uh, Strange Business came an interest in um, the power suit, specifically the 1980s power suit um, that women were wearing in um, the world of business, the corporate world. Um, and, and I, you know, I had it, I kind of outside understanding of this power suit because my mom never wore one. I didn't have anyone in my family who worked in, uh, who was a lawyer or a business person. Um, so it, it was almost a, a voyeuristic stance that I was taking on this suit. And, um, I was interested in how the architecture of the power suit sort of was made to um, make a feminine body appear more masculine. Um, these wide set shoulders, shoulder pads, um, like double breasted collars, um, sort of that all of a sudden there was this masculine power and the ideal was almost well if you if you're entering a world that wasn't made for you um you might as well wear some armor because you're going to be attacked um it's going to be tough and so you might as well like kind of root uh, a sense of power in this very like masculine form of clothing um and and that's i mean i i love wearing a power suit you know so it's interesting i'm it's not, a lot of times when I talk about things, I'm not saying, I, I usually um, don't try and take this stance of this is good or this is bad. Um, I just like to investigate it and kind of get in the muck um, and, and look at it from that vantage point. Um, and so these were three pieces um, that I made that were wall pieces. Um, that I made for my show Strange Business um, in 2000, early 2018. Um, and then I kind of kept going with this idea of the power suit. Um, and in 2019, I was asked to be in a two person booth at Spring Break Art Fair. Um, and, you know, the the theme of the booth it was um, me and another artist, Corey Escoto, 
Um, and he made these tissue boxes, um, which you'll see in a moment. And I made these power suits and everything. The show is called Gray Matter and it was kind of these gray and purple tones. Um, and for this piece, another set of hands, I mean, it's a it's an office term again for the title or kind of a um, like a working term. Um, and then, the, I, you know, these conical breasts that come out of the suit actually as acting as kind of armor, they're desexualized in a way. Um, and then the nipples have um, their own little hands to help you be more productive and also to protect you. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it's kind of this balance of like taking up space. Um, the hands are weighted. They have like, um, they're like bean bags essentially. Um, but also can kind of conforming to this, this, um, idea of masculine power. Um, and so along with this body of work for spring break, um, I made this video called Tying the Knot. Um, and it, it's um, a bow tie and tie tutorial. And I'll just show you a quick little clip of that. Bow tie is a descendant of the knot of kabat. Bow tie is a descendant of the knot of kabat. Bow tie is a descendant of the knot of kabat. Bow tie is a descendant of the knot of kabat. It was born from the need of her power that was easier to wear than the cravat. Active, that would last throughout a more active day. Active, active. The butterfly and bat big love ties were worn with dinner jackets and white bow ties with evening tails. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh my God. Um, here we go. So this was, um, and then this is the last piece that was made for this show um, called Hung Out to Dry. Um, and for this piece, it's a leather shirt um, with these yellow leather nipples and this pair of gloves coming out of the wall, holding it up. Um, and it's both humorous. Um, I was thinking about like the, these like breasts that reminded me of eggs, um, kind of like the domestic life of cooking. But I also was thinking about thinking about like what's it like? What's what's it like to have to wear um, a power suit all day in an environment that's not um, so welcoming for you? Or just what's it like um, to kind of uh, embrace body like sexist microaggressions and then how does that play out in how you feel when you you get home and have you take off your your armor your clothing um and here is a uh view of um the our booth gray matter and the tissue boxes that um Corey made um Okay, and so um, after after um, like kind of around after my show uh, Strange Business, I um, was asked to apply for a show in the project room at Brick in Brooklyn, um, and I applied with this idea, um, this show called Gymnasia, and it was really a look at um, the roots of gym culture and athleticism. Um, and, and like, I think that sports and business um, have a lot in common. Um, so it, it kind of, I think it made sense that I was interested in both worlds. Um, and I, I also coming from kind of like a personal um, place with sports, um, you know, I, I'm a cis woman and I identify as a woman. Um, I use she, her pronouns. 
Um, however, I felt at times uh, like particularly close to masculinity and, and sports. I was really into sports. Um, so I, I wasn't initially because I didn't think I was actually good at sports. Um, I had bad hand eye coordination and, you know, et cetera. But when I started, I started rowing weirdly in high school um, and I became kind of obsessed. Um, and it turns out that I was a really good rower was a champion um, and won a lot of medals. And I had this super intense crew coach and it ended up um, shaping a lot of my early kind of gender identity. Um, and it unlocked things in myself that I hadn't realized I enjoyed so much like squat pressing, bench pressing, and kind of this like over the top weightlifting. Um, and that was the first time that I, I could put a name, I think to my more masculine side, um, though I think it was there my entire life. I just didn't have like the language or space for it before. Um, and I became interested in how enamored I was with this idea of masculine power in my own body um, that I had tapped into. And it, and it came into my work, especially in this, this uh, body of work gymnasia. Um, and I think like, I'm still questioning a lot of that. Um, so for this, this um, small show at Brick, um, the sculptures that I created were also props for the video. Um, and they were these giant eight foot versions of um, ancient prize amphora. So the reason why our trophies are shaped with these um, kind of vases at the top um, is that that was the original trophy was um, a clay vessel that would contain usually olive oil um, that prize athletes would be given. Um, for winning a race, a wrestling match, gymnastics, et cetera. Um, and so I wanted to create those amphora out of um, athleisure. So these are um, quite large and they're, they're made out of like neoprene um, and mesh and spandex. Um, and then they also, all of the dancers costumes that I worked with, I also, uh, wrestlers, I also work with some wrestlers for this project. They're all the costumes kind of have a, this one-to-one -one relationship with the amphora, almost as if the figures were taken off of the amphora and put in the videos. Um, so they, they're wearing the same fabrics. Um, so here are some installation views as well as video stills. Um, so I worked with four dancers, um, two wrestlers and a group of uh, uh, my friends who became the Greek chorus, you can see in the middle slide there. And then I also wanted that group of friends slash Greek chorus to feel like sports commentators in a way. So they kind of move throughout the video um, and they act as the sound bed for the entire piece. So it was a 10 minute, um, sort of song, spoken word, um, sound clip that I recorded with them. Um, and going back to what I was saying before, it's all found language. Um, so it's kind of a mixture of um, actual sports commentary um, and uh, sports quotes um, and also a lot of sports idioms that are used so often in our everyday speech and in politics and all over the place, which I also find really weird, but also not surprising at all. Um, so here's another view. Um, and there's the amphora in the background in the video. Um, so half the video was shot in a gym um, and half was in this kind of like cheesy neoclassical garden. Um, and the, you know, the gym, it was like, it's so, you know, we think about the word gym, we think about how gym is just like ingrained in our education um, here. Um, and I just was like really interested in looking at that and all those feelings that like gym brings up in childhood. Um, so here are some of the like kind of garden excerpts. Um, and then I'm going to show you, it's again, also a 20 minute kind of, or a 10 minute clip. Um, so there's a lot. So I'm gonna, I just have selected something here that I wanted to show you. And 
from my work with gymnasia and athleisure fabrics, I um, started to kind of question like how um, could I use, like could I use the wrong fabric for the wrong form? Could I swap form for, um, for you know, like, if I was gonna make a business suit, could I could I make a business suit using athleisure fabrics or tech fabrics or something? So that was sort of um, for about a year. I didn't have any big shows. I wasn't having any solo shows, and so I really explored in my studio, um, just like mixing up material. Um, and I got really into um, the materiality of uh, neoprene mesh, which is like a foam spacer mesh. Um, and I made this um, gigantic piece <laughs> called It's Rough Out There um, out of um, this neoprene mesh. And um, I was thinking about um, like an Elizabethan collar, also like a car, uh, like a carburetor for car um, and just kind of flipping those forms um, together um, and then having like the weight of something like that collar, um, just like land on top of a pair of breasts and have the, have like the nipples actually like <laughs> from that impact, like unfurl and then like roll back. Um, and then, you know, a, a greater like pop culture reference is like the Wicked Witch of the West getting trapped by the house and her legs, you know, shrivel up, like go out and roll back up. Um, so having kind of some fun with those forms. Um, deep pockets um, for this work, I was thinking about um, it just like the history of the pocket in general and, and how uh, they're, you know, it's not really, we don't, women's clothing generally, like it's really great if it has a pocket that you can actually put your whole hand inside. Um, but generally pockets haven't been there. And uh, that's like for a very specific reason because you know, if you have a pocket, it means you can put things in there. It means you can leave the house. Um, I don't know. And so, and just kind of like thinking about um, the ways, like the adaptations um, women have made throughout time to kind of give their, their clothing pockets or bags um, to carry the things that they need to work, to leave the house, et cetera. Um, and then pink collar, um, kind of expanding upon that that ruffle form of the co the collar that I showed in the last slide, putting it on the wall, flipping it around so the breasts are flattened but going up the wall. Um, good cheer. So you know, um, thinking about like again the nipple as something that it's it's not like meant to do that it's kind of kind of has like um some sort of purpose uh or job to do that the nipple becomes like its own character almost um and is carrying whistles that it can blow in and out um you know and this piece is sort of about that about a cheerleader maybe um for these pieces that i made in 2019 again like i said i was really just like exploring material clothing form um, and kind of seeing um, what the, all of that felt like. Um, and here's a piece, Jim Schwartz um, sort of 
you know, thinking about this, what, what did, what did gym shorts say in this context and kind of like the gray sweatpant, um, you know, um, and using that. Um, and then late in 2019, I was asked to be in a two person show with a painter um, named Elizabeth Glasner. And she, in her work, a lot of times kind of creates these um, mythologies and shapeshifter figures. Um, and so I wanted to respond and be in conversation with her painting. So I created these two pieces for that show, um, Leggings for a Satyr um, and The Hand That Feeds. And so, you know, I mean, like Leggings for a Satyr, thinking about the, the Satyr character, um, you know, as a, as kind of this like, sexual deviant that's like running around um ancient Greece and Rome just I mean not I mean possibly like raping people you know I mean he's like it's a real you know he's just this this character that um I was always pretty uncomfortable by um and just making a satyr a pair of leggings um and it, initially I thought that the cork, like there's like a wooden cork in the center that the piece hangs from. Maybe it was a, a hole for his tail. Um, maybe it it is emasculating in some way. Um, and then just this, these empty sort of pockets of like a kind of, you know, going back to like a, a sad businessman's pockets that have, or, you know, being emptied. Um, and with, this leather glove piece um i was looking a lot at like the people who have the you know guinness book of world Wec records like longest fingernails um and just the kind of devotion uh it takes to grow your nails that long and also like my interest in femininity gone too far that it starts with like um this you know feminine culture of of having your nails painted, growing out your nails, um, having long nails, and it becomes something that you're actually not even you're you're so you're you're not really able to perform or work anymore um, in a capitalist culture. Like if your nails are that long, so I just, I just like I kind of like that rebellion in a way. Um, I'm going to keep going because I think. Well, actually, I think I have time. So this was a piece that I made in during quarantine, during the first kind of lockdown in early uh, 2020. Um, and it's called The Weird Sisters. And I, um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. I just got a notification of maybe it was some so double checking. Um, and for the, the Weird Sisters, I, I was thinking about the weird sisters are the witches in Macbeth and they they ultimately predict Macbeth's downfall um and they also act as like a Greek chorus in a way throughout the whole play um and kind of you know we we're in this pandemic that was really scary and I you know we we're all stuck in our respective houses um our you know, apartments and, and just kind of, you know, all of the prediction that went into that, the mishandling of the pandemic, um, and the, you know, this like very, um, I wanted to, I created this like set where it was lined with plastic, um, and I could, I could only reach in through these holes, um, and I started making slime, <laughs> um, so I, and I was like getting into kind, kind of thinking about like ASMR slime videos um, and just all of these things sort of mixed together. So I'll show you um, a little clip of this one. I'm gonna move a little bit ahead. Hopefully that works. Thank <laughs> you. 
that I was so interested in slime is that I, I like that it's it's undefinable, that it's not a liquid or a solid, it's, it's slime. Um, I'm interested in how like slime molds um, can, they, it sort of works as like this collaborative, um, you know, microcosm and that it can find its way out of mazes um, it can find food sources and share it with the whole like slime body. Um, so I think, and this is, I'm sharing this actually, because this is the only slime piece I've done so far, but look out like my, <laughs> my next big bit video work is going to be about slime. Um, so it's interesting. I share this because I made it and it felt at the time, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it kind of this one-off piece. And then it's a lot of times that happens. And then I end up bringing it back in um, to the work um, in a way that, that makes sense. Um, so in, so that kind of brings us, it's getting, we're getting a little closer to where I am now. Um, the last, about a year ago, um, I was asked to be in a three person show in, in uh, Montreal at a, a gallery called Projet Panchi. And it was with two painters. Um, and so I made these works that I'm sharing kind of inspired by both of their work, um, but also sort of connecting to um, like power suit pieces I had made before, um, but sort of entering some new bodies of research. So um, this piece, Good Breast, Bad Breast um, was inspired, the form was inspired by um, a Bertha, a shaker style Bertha, which is kind of like a modesty cape um, that shaker woman, women wore. Um, and so I, I liked that form um, a lot of this cape that I, that was the specific cape I used. And so I recreated it in leather. Um, I wanted the colors of the leather to feel totally foreign to the, the Bertha cape itself to feel almost like sports colors. Um, I mean, there's a, I, the orange is neon, but it's essentially like Mets colors, which is kind of gross. Um, but I wanted that, I wanted that it to feel like a little um, hard to put your finger on, on what colors and why. Um, and the breasts uh, are holding these um, carved wooden uh, nails. And so um, the title of the piece, Good Breast, Bad Breast, um, refers to Melanie Klein's uh, psychoanalytic theory, um, which is the idea that the human baby, if breastfed, understands their mother's breast as an object, um, good when it's feeding them, bad when it's not. Um, so, you know, that theory aside, I'm interested in like the subjectivity of the breast in general. Um, enthralled by the breast um, beyond the Madonna horror complex, beyond mother, um, non-mother capacity for understanding. Just, I'm curious about breasts that serve unexpected tasks and purposes. Um, and I use the form of the shaker Bertha because it's an object, it's meant for modesty, covering the breasts while also referencing um, the shaker woman as an object maker. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was a shaker woman who invented the circular saw. It's exciting. Um, okay, so this is another piece uh, that was in this show um, together with the cape that we just looked at. Um, 
It's called Open Lock. It's based on a chastity belt um, inspired by that uh, chastity belt on the right that I included the picture of. Um, and I used, um, this is the first time since Stone Age Toolkit that I brought a carved stone back into the work, which was super exciting. Um, and I'm continuing to kind of keep going with that. Um, so the uh, stone pieces in the center are two different kinds of soapstone. Um, and wait, oh, I skipped. I'm going to come back to this one in a second. Hold on. Okay. So also for this show, um, I usually, you know, like I said, I like to make work that if it's a small group show is inspired by the people that I'm showing with. Um, and both um, the two painters that I was showing with, um, Daniel Orchard and Gahi Park, they both, I think, have an interesting response and connection to um, modern painting, both like cubism and surrealism. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I've never take, even though I'm coming from an art history background, that was my major in undergrad, I've never really like quite taken that on directly. Um, and I've never thought about paintings as objects in the same way that I'm thinking about bags or clothing or tools, like a uh, painting, maybe it's the same, you know? Um, and so I, I looked at this painting um, called Woman with a Book after Leger. Um, and I picked the painting based on the title, um, also based on the fact that I actually like this painting. Um, but the, you know, the title, of course, Woman with a Book is like, it's like the book as a prop, not as an act of um, pleasure and education. Um, and I also picked this painting because it was so, uh, shape driven. Um, and so I envisioned it actually like each shape was a like a distinct kind of cut out shape that I upholstered. Um, and the, the, you know, the things that I changed were clearly the color and material of the piece, but also her, the breast, this conical weaponized breast that's piercing through the book. Um, and then the flowers became these um, leather, black leather roses. Um, and I, that was the first time I made leather flowers, which I've continued on. And it was something that felt really creepy and really good. So I've kind of kept going with that. Um, and then as a response to this piece um, in the summer, this summer, I was asked to um, create a solo booth at um, for Nada House, which is New Art Dealers Association. It's like a house that they set up on Governor's Island in New York. Um, and I created um, another woman with a book relief piece, um, this time after Picasso. And um, this was interesting because I don't this got, a, this got a little weird for me because I don't actually love this painting. Um, I don't really love Picasso. Um, and so it brought up a lot of questions of like, why, why am I making this? And, and yeah, and so I don't fully think that I've, I've answered that in completion with myself. Um, but, you know, what I was thinking about is that, um, just like, you know, in this painting, I mean, Picasso is referencing an earlier painting by Ong um, and kind of paying homage to that with the same composition. Um, so in both paintings, um, there's this reflection of a profiled face um, of, this, of the subject in the background. But um, in the case of Woman with a Book by Picasso, um, Art historians speculate this is actually a mere reflection of Picasso acting as like kind of a self-portrait behind his muse. Um, and the, the muse that he's painting in this painting is um, Marie Therese, um, you know, who was uh, 17 at the time they started, you know, 
as she became Miss Muse. Um, and I was just thinking about how, like historically the muse doesn't get to choose um, how they are represented by the artist depicting them. They remain entrapped um, within this canonized object forever. Um, so it's like they're servile to a gaze that's never their own. So this for this piece, I wanted to free um, Marie Therese <laughs> um, from her post and um, shroud her in this anonymity so that um, she may become a cyborg like creature. Um, so we have no clue where she's gone. A lot of what we're left with is Picasso to face head on, um, being that that's his profile in the leather um, frame of the piece. Um, so going back to this work, um, this was another piece that was in the show that I made this for this summer on Governor's Island. Um, and so I kind of took on these objects and archetypes um, and paintings from the art historical canon. And so I was looking at um, Sheila and Giggs, which are, um, they are Irish uh, gargoyle figures um, found on some cathedrals in Ireland and England. Um, and they sort of are this, this figure that it is like from the time period between paganism and Catholicism. Um, and I was interested in how their meaning is not quite, you know, there's no one um, interpretation of them. Um, we see the form, we see what it is, and that's kind of what we're left with. And so they have been taken on um, as feminist icons um, in this like very powerful um, exposing, um, you know, feminine genitals, like a kind of like a, uh, fertility birthing, like the, you know, that sort of power and like full out there. Um, and then on the other hand, some people interpret them to be like warning against promiscuity. Um, and that's why they were on these cathedrals. Um, and I'm interested in the reasons like we, that we don't actually, that there isn't, it's not totally clear. Um, and so for this piece, um, I titled it Curtain Call. Um, and it was a direct kind of copy of the form of the Sheila and gig. Um, and um, yeah, and, and kind of going back to maybe my, what I initially told you all about my interest in kind of the materiality of um, religious spaces in, in velvet and shrouding. Um, and so like anonymity is really a big thing in my work. So it's something, and, and that's something that I appreciate about the world of kink, which is which is also plays into my work. Um, and it's where, you know, the object or person or performer has full control over what they're revealing about their body, um, about their gender, about their power or about their submissiveness. Um, and they get to show you, but as the viewer or audience member, whoever's looking at the work, there's not necessarily much viewer power. Um, the power is in the object and through what's being presented or not presented. Um, so I liked, and that's why I chose to have the curtain um, call like falling above the breasts and then the curtain in um, the hole as well. Um, and then this was another, I made a this piece responding to a still life painting um, by this painter named Rachel Roish, um, who was painting during the Dutch golden age. And um, she supported a family of 10 children off of her paintings. And um, I was just kind of interested in flowers and bouquets as symbols um, for mortality, for, um, for taste, um, class, um, gender, you know, and, and I recreated her painting that's on the right in this all leather bouquet. Um, and then there's two gloved hands um, where the nails are kind of entwined around the flowers reaching up into the bouquet. Um, and then this wooden mount that I had made for this piece. So the flowers actually thread through the mount um, and then the gloves are kind of cuff, cuffed on the side. Here's the installation image. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to skip, so we won't watch this, but I will, I'll tell you about it. This was a video piece that I made for the show on Governor's Island 
that um, was based on an essay um, by Sylvia Federici called On the Meaning of Gossip. Um, and I, I recommend reading the essay. Um, I also, if you'd like to go watch this video, uh, I may not, I will have it up on my website soon, um, but it's um, the, essentially like it kind of really just is, takes us, it's the first time I use subtitles, it takes us through the essay um, and um, the understanding of the, how the word gossip has changed over time. So initially the word gossip was a word um, meant, it meant um, like your friends that weren't your family. So you're really close friends and generally you're really close female friends. Um, and, you know, around kind of the medieval era, um, late medieval era, um, it was sort of turned into a word um, meaning with its meaning that we know today of, of backbiting talk um, that was generally performed by women with nothing better to do. Um, and what was interesting to me about this is that essentially it was, you know, communication, talking to each other is a form of power. It's how we communicate, we share what's wrong with each other. We have a healing space. Um, and, and it's, it's essentially like throughout history, it's that kind of communication amongst people has always been squashed. Um, so just kind of thinking about that and then the history of certain words and language, um, the word gossip being one of those words. Um, and I'm gonna skip because I'm running behind, but um, this, I, the next works I'm gonna show you are um, inspired by bags. Um, and so if you, you know, can take a quick read through this quote by Ursula K. Le Guin, a science fiction writer, um, just kind of thinking um, about the bag as actually like the first human tool was really exciting for me um, and inspired this, um, this body of work. So um, here we go. I'm gonna go quickly, the flight attendant's bag, um, thinking about like the idea of the sky wife, um, to, you know, having to smile, having to be polite all day, um, so exhausted that they need to smoke two cigarettes out of each nipple. Um, let's see, I think, oh, here we go, tool bag. So this was modeled after um, a Carhartt tool bag, but, um, I play it's again, I was interested in like, what if I change the material of the, of the, what we know to be a tool bag um, and use this like luxurious um, kind of snakeskin looking leather um, and, and kind of what changes about that bag. Um, and then also having these stools uh, or tables made specifically for these bags. So they have, um, they have holes in the top for each of the legs to go through and then they, they sort of sit almost like a they're saddled in there and they they can't really go anywhere um so they're made and they're kind of at that pitch um no one else can sit on the stool but that bag um similar to this table as well so again what happens when i take the same pattern of the tool bag and change the material um, and then that brings us to right now, I just um, installed a solo show um, in London at Public Gallery um, and that I was there for uh, five weeks this summer and I made about half the show there. Um, and so it's called Flex Point. And um, for this show, I was really, I was inspired by um, it was sort of like a mix of everything I've talked about. So really um, bar fitness, which is a, a type of fitness that is kind of like a combination of ballet and Pilates and like high intensity interval training. Um, and it's kind of fanatical and nuts. Um, and so using bar fitness um, language and um, kind of choreography in the video work um, and then, and thinking about that and then what is kind of the antidote to to that world um, of like optimizing oneself to bar um, and a lot of the 
the works, which I show you, will show you. So on the first floor, this is the ground floor, um, the um, piece that was behind the, the pink bag is called affordable facelift and it's a wall relief piece. Um, and the form for it was taken from these um, silicone like wrinkle pads that I get advertisements for on my Instagram feed constantly. Um, and it's actually called a facelift. Um, and so using that exact pack that you would buy um, and recreating these upholstered uh, diamond tufted cushions um, using that form. And then this tongue um, and it, the, the tongue was interesting. I was like, oh, it needs a tongue. And, and you know, when I told a few people, they were like, I don't understand why. And it actually was coming through some of the choreography from the video, but I hadn't totally realized that yet. Um, and then a snake tongue piercing, which is the piercing that's there on the right. Um, I just, I was interested in the ways um, humans make modifications to their bodies to become more animal-like. Um, another leather bouquet inspired by Rachel Roish, um, like a much darker sort of forest floor painting. Um, ballet bag. Um, you know, the thinking about the, the ballerina's duffel bag or their gym bag, um, same legs that are used on the tool bags, um, which are essentially kind of this like cut out of a stocking Barbie doll type leg, um, you know, impossible to stand on that foot in a constant flexed position or pointed position. Um, and this bag has, um, this bag has like these cloven toes and snake tongues sticking out. Um, and then here we go. Um, so I wanted to share this. Um, let me just try and move this thing out of the way. Um, I wanted to share this quote um, because it gives a little bit of like where I was coming from. I was really inspired um, by this essay that one of my favorite writers writing right now, Gia Tolentino wrote called, called Always Be Optimizing. Um, and so she really talks about FAR. Um, so the, when the class started, it was this immediate state of emergency. Um, and, you know, but, and then going on to really talk about like the greater implications or symbolism of, of something like FAR. Um, the endurance that FAR builds is possibly more psychological than physical. What it's really good at is getting you in shape for a hyper accelerated capitalist life. Uh, it prepares you less for a half marathon than for a 12 hour work day. Um, and, you know, so that was kind of a jumping off point for a lot of the work and the video. Um, here's my mood board that I prepared for the video. So combining um, these, these are paintings by Charles Sheeler, um, who painted like kind of a lot of machinery, um, sort of from the industrial revolution time period, um, mixed with like some futurist, um, costumes and then images of bar classes and kind of advertisements in general. Um, here are some clips of, um, from the video, which is called Flex Point. Um, and that's kind of the top floor of the gallery in London. Um, is has its own full room. And um, and I'm I really would love to show you the video, but I've talked for too long. So I want to I want to go to questions. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna breeze through everything. Um, so thinking about what is the what do we do in this um, in this lifestyle where we're sort of always optimizing um, or pressured to be optimizing um, our body, our appearance, um, everything we do uh, for this kind of capitalist gain. Um, and thinking about like the shape shifter um, as, as, as an answer or a cyborg as an answer or the cyborg, um, roots in like shaped mythological shapeshifters and just that shapeshifters or cyborgs they're they're usually um feminine figures that sort of understand their artificiality um but they 
generally in most stories, they rebel. Um, and we don't know what they're thinking. And I, I liked that, that element of power in the cyborg and the shapeshifter. Um, so I made the rest of the pieces for the show are all inspired by various um, shapeshifters. Um, so floor model, Lone Wolf, inspired by the wolf woman, um, Romulus and Remus, you know, it's, there's, there's so many wolf woman references. Um, and then here's an installation view of the basement floor of the gallery, which is called the, the animal animal floor. Um, so, and then another view. Um, so thinking about Arachne, the spider maiden, this piece is titled Spinner, um, Swan Lake, uh, thinking about swan maidens um, and sirens uh, and those figures. There they are together. Uh, Selkie's gym bag. So, you know, going back again to my interest in the bag um, and thinking about the Selkie, uh, which is an Irish, she's an Irish seal woman, shapeshifter, um, who comes to land and is kind of entrapped by a fisherman and then her, you know, becomes kind of a domesticated figure. And then she's always aiming to go back to the ocean and she, ha she just has to find her coat, her seal coat. Um, which the fisherman hides from her. So, um, and again, the table is made for this, it, she sits in there perfectly. So the seal tail goes through the hole and then her feet and fins come out the other end. Um, there's, and then last piece um, is um, inspired by toy horses or hobby horses and it's called Kelpie's Revenge. Um, a Kelpie is another shapeshifter uh, horse woman that hangs around bodies of water. Um, and just thinking about the horse as a toy, a gendered toy in general, that, you know, I think um, my experience of the horse wasn't through, um, through like kind of the cowboy reference. It was more, um, like these these plastic horses, um, My Little Ponies. Um, you know, I went to horse camp. I desperately wanted to be like a, a horse girl. Um, I was actually really scared of horses, so it didn't work out. But I think there's something there's something that is really interesting to me about horses and toys and kids and gender and just like how that all plays out. So uh that's it i'm going to stop share <laughs> i'm sorry that went so long no that's okay i'm glad it went over i went i wanted to see the rest of the pieces i'm sure everyone else did too um thank you so much rose for your presentation that was wonderful um we'll go ahead and start taking questions from the audience so please take a moment to type out your questions in the chat. I do see there already are a few, so I'll go ahead and start with those. Um, Jill asks, I'm so curious about your physical process. Do you prototype your pieces and eventually land on a final form, or do you make your pieces all in one go? And lastly, I'm curious about where your materials come from. Thank you for an amazing presentation. Oh, thank you for listening. Um, so that's a good question. I think in the beginning, um, when I first started working with fabric and soft sculpture, uh, I wouldn't prototype at all. I would just go for it. Um, however, as I've progressed, um, the kind of the level of like craftspersonship has really gone up in my work. Um, and now I, I, okay, so basically my process now is I draw first or I research first, draw, then based on the drawing, I sometimes create like a much larger two scale drawing on my wall that I then use for patterns. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, depending. Then, it, then it's a figuring out time with like paper and this like pattern making cloth that I'll actually sew. Um, and I figure out, okay, how can I create this pattern, this three dimensional pattern um, then sometimes if it's complex enough, like the Swan Lake 
I was using mirrored vinyl, um, which was really difficult to work with and also really expensive. So um, I had to make it advance in advance in a cheaper vinyl. So I actually made two versions of that piece, made sure that it was I was able to bungee it onto the hoop um, before making the final version. Um, and I get most of my materials in the garment district in New York. And I love going material shopping. It's really fun. Um, I spend, it, they're expensive, you know? So I spend all of my money. People are always like, why don't you have more interesting clothes that you wear? I'm like, cause I spend it all on these fabrics that I buy in the garment district. And I haven't gone clothing shopping in like five years. So that's why, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, I have another question from Lily. Um, have you read the essay Trick Mirror by Julia Talentio <laughs> called Pure Bar? That essay sits very nicely with the ideas you're talking about within your late show. And thank you so much for your amazing talk. Yeah, sorry. I wrote that right before you but, said that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was very cool that immediately I was just like, oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gia, Gia Tolentino is brilliant. Um, so I, I, everything she puts out, I read. <laughs> yeah. All right. I have another question from Sophia. They said, thank you, Rose, for your amazing work. I wanted to ask if you could recommend any theoretical references on how clothes or fashion can shape gender identities and culture. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, trying to think oh you know I don't know if I can give you anything off the top of my head that is specifically about clothing or fashion and gender identity um but I will think I can email um you know Christine Lily um and Marley put it out there. Also, I'm a huge fan of crowdsourcing. So if there's someone in the audience who knows more than me about that, put it out there. Because I, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you in advance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, if anyone has any last minute questions, please feel free to ask them at this time. Otherwise, we will end this week's lecture. So I'll wait, wait a minute, see if anyone else has any more questions. I don't think so. All right. So it looks like we don't have any additional questions. So we will conclude our program today. Once again, thank you all for attending this week's visiting artist program lecture with Rose. We hope that you enjoyed today's lecture and we look forward to seeing you again soon on October 6th for Shona McAndrew. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye. <laughs> Stop recording.